So now the main speaker of today with a longer introduction, Dr. Dave Trung is an assistant professor in the Department of Biomedical Engineering at New York University. Prior to his appointment, he was a lead scientist and part of the founding team at Neochromosome, a synthetic biology genomics company now owned by OpenTrons. And he received his PhD from the University of Texas at Austin, a bachelor degree from UC San Diego, and did postdoctoral work with Jeff uh, Brook uh, at NIU uh, School of Medicine. Dr. Trung's research interests span the field of synthetic and systems biology, but with a focus toward building new cell therapies and regenerative medicine by rewriting the genome of stem cells. He has received a numerous award, including Daily Nasser Award from Genetic Society of America, a National Research Service Award from NIGMS NIH, a Small Business Innovative Research Award from NIAID, and on NIH Director's New Innovator Award, the most competitive NIH Junior Faculty Award. So when I when I kind of preparing for his introduction, I kind of wonder uh, whether I'm you know introducing you know big name or you know junior faculty. So it's my true honor to have him today. So Dave. Uh, basically, you know, please take it away and thank you so much for, you know, uh, your time uh, today. And then I'm looking forward to your talk. Well, um, yeah, thank you for that really kind introduction, Taesuk. I've actually been looking forward to this talk all year, ever since he announced it. I was like, what a fantastic idea to introduce, you know, such a huge community, right? Synthetic biology is a very large community of like-minded people. Uh, we all have shared interest in building using biology as parts. Uh, like him, I actually uh, define synthetic biology quite broadly, you know. So I, I cut my teeth in, you know, traditional biomedical sciences where, you know, you're knocking out a gene and you're trying to figure out some new rule, saying maybe I discover something or maybe I don't. But when you think about synthetic biology, it's a totally different perspective, right? You're saying there's a whole universe of biology out there. There are hundreds of thousands of genomes and there are all these parts in there. How do we put this all together in new ways? How do we build something new that's either useful in the market or useful for humanity itself? And so I, you know, came up in the genome engineering field uh, early on with DNA editing, um, and I really had to think hard about how do we scale up. And so my group has been focused on writing the human genome itself. And so I'll talk to you about technologies for writing large sections of the human genome in pluripotent stem cells to eventually make different types of cell therapies. Um, I also can talk to you about my journey from academia to the commercial sector and back again which was kind of a bit of a circuitous path, but it's mostly to tell you that, you know, those doors aren't closed. You can come back, those doors are more open than they used to be. And I certainly have some insights if people have questions about it. So yeah. let me start. Um, first, I wanna tell you about my disclosures. Um, as Taysuk mentioned, I was an employee at Neochromosome Inc., uh, my own private stock in the company. And um, everything I'm presenting today is under a, a pending patent. So uh, I'm currently a professor at New York University in the biomedical engineering department. It's actually a new department. So we're kind of trying to get our name out there as, long, as well as my name. So today's talk is gonna be about programming off the shelf human iPSCs. Off the shelf meaning things you can take out of the freezer and just give to anyone without having to manipulate uh, human cells from a patient cells. So my lab, um, which actually just started September, so our lab's only 
about you know less than a year old. Uh, we're interested in three broad areas. It's uh, genome writing, this concept of writing large sections of the human genome to new designer configurations, building off the shelf human iPSCs so that we can continue to manipulate the cells and make different types of cells, and then cell fate decisions, turning those human iPSCs into uh, useful cells, mostly immune cells at this point, but also eventually other somatic cells for regenerative medicines. And this combination of genome writing, off-the-shelf cells, and any cell that you can imagine making means that you can keep coming back to them and in increase the functionality. So I think we're really entering an exciting era in synthetic biology. You know, mammalian cells have been this kind of big black box that's, you know, a little complex to try to deal with. But innovations in areas like gene therapy, um, which there are a number of FDA approved modalities for gene therapy. Cell immunotherapy is used in T cells, specifically CAR T cells for uh, liquid cancers. And the continually growth of regenerative medicine and tissue engineering means we have this great opportunity to address many diseases that you know, we traditionally haven't had quick new modalities for, including cancer, autoimmune diseases, and even rejuvenation. I mean, we've all heard about companies getting huge billion dollar you know, investments to go at rejuvenation and aging. And this all goes back to biology, manipulating it as a substrate itself. So when I mentioned genome writing, this idea is that we can actually rewrite sections of the human genome. We've all heard about DNA editing, specifically CRISPR, zinc finger nucleases or talons. And so here in this example of a part of the human genome, uh, a paragraph from The Hobbit. Editing is where you can actually go in and modify a single word. You know, CRISPR is very good at cutting pieces of sections of the genome, uh, deleting parts of it, or modifying little sections. But it's less good at, you know, making large edits because these deep breaks that happen in the genome can become catastrophic and it's hard to manipulate what happens. You can get strange translocations, inversions, delete large deletions that you can't detect. So CRISPR editing gets a little, you know, wonky. With writing, you actually design new configurations of sections of genomes and write over a large section. So you can imagine on a computer designing up new large sections to entirely new configuration and writing multiple iterations of it. So writing has actually uses it actually pretty simple. It uses budding yeast. Uh, as a little factory for building these linear segments of DNA. Yeast have this really high efficiency of high homologous recombination. So you can basically use yeast to assemble these designer segments into a much larger construct. And this basic technology has been used to build entirely synthetic genomes. 2010, you know, the synthetic mycobacterium, from Craig Venter's group, Jason Chin's group built a completely new redesigned E. coli genome in 2019. And Jeff Buka's group, who I was a postdoc with, has been re rewriting the entire yeast genome, uh, every chromosome since 2012, and they will soon release every single chromosome. So yeast is 12 megabases of DNA. We now have an opportunity to address the three gigabases of DNA in mammalian cells, specifically humans and mice, to do various new things, including disease modeling, but also making new cell therapies. Um, so there's examples of genome writing. Uh, there are a couple of previous examples. So in uh, Jeff's lab and Leslie Mitchell, who's the CEO of Neochromosome, they actually wrote a designer segment of a 110 kilobase human HPRT gene and popped it into mouse cells. Here's a Western blot showing that the human version of this genomic locus is expressed and made into a protein in mice. In a bioarchive paper that's gonna come out uh, being published soon. They rewrote the Hawks A locus, which controls body patterning, uh, delivering a 170,000 uh, base pair rat Hawks A locus to the mouse genome, and actually moved all the enhancers, these regulatory elements, from which are really far away to much closer. So they basically rewrote this locus. So I, I suggest you check out this paper. And we recently showed that you can write in 144 kilobase human SOX2 locus. Uh, which is a stem cell transcription factor into mice cells. 
And so these are all the technologies. They're a bit limited in where you can put them. What my group has been interested in is making a new uh, technology for writing in DNA into the new genome. And we call these, these things called landing pads. Landing pads are basically pieces of DNA that are optimized for putting in much larger constructs. Um, so most of the landing pads out there don't really have all the features that I want. The features that we wanted were one that we can put in very large constructs, 100 kilobases or more, up to 300 or 500 kilobases. Uh, the uh, DNA should have everything all inside of it, all everything you need, so it's all in one. At the end, it should be scarless or nearly scarless, meaning any markers you use should be able to be removed or never be there in the first place. It should just be what you want wrote, written in. You can place it anywhere in the genome, uh, no limitations about where you put it, and we should be able to repeat it, putting in 300 KB plus products one by one so that you can get out to millions of base pairs and thus start writing out millions of base pairs of the human genome. So what I, I'll tell you about is this technology wrote called Rewrite, um, which will eventually offer megabase scale genome writing. The con concept is basically pretty simple. Um, you use CRISPR to delete a large segment, say 100 kilobases, but even like two megabases or you know more, and you pop in your landing pad, which is only a small construct, about 5 kb, into human iPSCs. So now you remove this large section uh, with your landing pad. You then use yeast to build in your new designer construct. This could be a smaller one. It could be 5 kb, but it could also be two megabases if you have the wherewithal to assemble this large construct. And then you pop it in to essentially rewrite over the genomic segment. So conceptually, it's quite straightforward. Um, so the way that rewrite works is actually this. I'm going to show you an example of how rewrite works. And it has all the features that I talked about. Here's the rewrite landing pad. It actually uses traditional technologies like Cree and Flip because these have no size limitations and they're much more specific, meaning you won't get these catastrophic uh, rearrangements in the DNA. It's just going to pop in what you want. It actually use markers and has an inducible pre-recombinase. You have a payload construct that put, you have your uh, designer segment, 200 kilobases, 100 kilobases or more, and a promoterless version of the markers. You turn it on, it writes over what's currently there, bring it in your new construct. You can select for this marker, and then you can repeat this, bring in a new construct, going back to the old markers, popping it in, bringing in a new segment, and then it has an inducible removal cassette built right in, a flip ERT. You turn this on and it basically cleans up everything. So now you just are left with essentially what you want other than these little box sites, which are small. So rewrite allows you to write over a large section of the human genome. We're gonna show you an example of how we've been using rewrite for uh, writing off the shelf human iPSCs. So first of all, I wanted to mention that the rewrite landing pad, um, we put this into the ROSA26 locus in mouse cells initially. ROSA26 is considered a safe harbor, meaning it shouldn't be silenced, but you can see right away when we did uh, immunofluorescence and flow cytometry that the rewrite landing pad, when we didn't select for the landing pad, it silenced right away, which is surprising. Within three days, that thing was silenced. The gene expression was not good. This would suggest that we may not be able to put it wherever we want it. So I rebuilt new versions uh, where we added some elements that would prevent silencing. And now you can see in this version three that without selection after six days, silencing is no longer an issue, meaning that you can just keep using um, rewrite anywhere and you don't have to worry about using selection. And I can also say that in human iPSCs, rewrite has been going for over 30 days in culture, no selection required, no silencing, it's completely active and stays active. Um, and my students, uh, PhD student Sarah Levovitz and uh, technician Susanna Yarmillo, they've actually placed rewrite all over the genome in eight different places, uh, safe harbors, uh, silenced regions, active regions, and these are all active in culture, no silencing. And Sarah Levitz has actually deleted a megabase region, the human Hoxae locus, including a bunch of genes nearby and placed a landing pad there. So there are, we can basically place it anywhere in the genome um, and use it for putting in new pieces of DNA. So what is the big piece of DNA we are mostly interested in right now? It's this immune genes called the HLAs or human leukocyte antigens. These basically control how your immune system recognizes 
uh, self versus non-self. So on every one of our cells, there are these genes called HLAs. They basically are covering the surface of every single cell. And they basically take proteins that are degraded within the cell and pop them on the outside. Okay, so HLAs are sort of a window into the soul of the cell. And they basically tell the immune system, this is me, you know, these are proteins that I make, or new proteins, foreign proteins, like I'm infected by a virus or I have cancer and I have a unique mutation. So that's, that's how our immune system actually identifies what's going on in the cells. And so we are trying to manipulate those HLA genes so that we can then interface with the immune system and prevent immune rejection. And this was a continuing collaboration with neochromosome. So iPCs are very interesting because they can continuously grow in culture and we can use them as an unlimited supply of somatic cells for basically any disease, regenerative medicine. You know, we can make heart cells for you know, cardiac disease, uh, pancreatic cells for diabetes. And so if we can start to manipulate iPSCs, you can have this unlimited supply. Um, and even better is if we can have an iPSC that just can be given to anyone. So the current uh, uh, paradigm for using iPSCs is actually to take them from each patient, right? And that was the big innovation of iPSCs. You can take a skin cell from any patient, put in the four factors, four master transcription factors, and make new iPSCs that you can then turn to somatic cells for each person. It's what we call autologous iPSCs. Unfortunately, this is really expensive. You know, you have to get the patient, make the cells, and then you have to go through all these um, quality control to make sure that the cells can differentiate. They don't have any genetic abnormalities. Um, and doing all that uh, to clinical good manufacturing practice grade or CGMP uh, is estimated to be a million dollars or more, especially if then you have to make the cells that can then, then be used. A better approach is actually have what we call allogeneics iPSCs or an off the shelf cell. Shells that, cells that are already in a cryo freezer, turn into the somatic cells you want, also frozen, and then directly given to patients. Speeds it up, centralizes manufacturing and reduces costs. And with technologies like DNA editing and genome writing, you can now imagine putting in new features into the cells, making them safer, more efficacious, adding in circuits to make them do new things. And these can also be frozen. This is the future, it's not here yet, right? So we have to start thinking about how we do this. So why can't we just take an iPSC that's made from me and just give it to you already, right? I mentioned this idea of HLAs. So here, imagine this is your somatic cell you've made as a donor cell. It has HLAs and HLAs are actually the most genetically diverse genes in the human population, that entire chromosome region. You get a foreign cell from me and give it to you, your host immune system is gonna recognize these foreign HLAs and eventually have an immune reaction to it. Your uh, antigen presenting cells, things like dendritic cells or macrophages will pick up these donor HLAs as well as the peptides from the cells, pick them up, put them inside and display them to your T cells, which will then find a way to create new T cell receptors or even antibodies and thus kill those cells. The T cells will destroy the cells, antibodies will inactivate them, recruit immune cells. And so basically your immune system finds a way to identify these foreign cells and would kill them off. What we wanna do is make it so that the HLAs actually match you already so that you, it basically already says, hey, this is me. And so I mentioned that the HLAs are the most diverse regions of the genome. They're actually also the most difficult to edit. So there are three genes that we're actually uh, focus on. These are called the class one HLAs. There are three genes, HLA A, B, and C. These are homologs of each other. They're almost identical. They also span 1.4 megabases with a whole bunch of other genes in between, and they're full of genetic repeats. So editing this region is incredibly complicated. In addition, these are incredibly polymorphic in different ethnic populations. Each of these genes have hundreds of different alleles, which are only very biased couple of mutations. And here, for example, is the diversity in just an Asian population, which is, you know, more homogenous for HLA-A. Here you can see all these different HLA variants saying that if I were to take a cell from me, it wouldn't match to most other people. 
right? So it's a really difficult problem. This is actually the transplant matching problem. When you are waiting for a transplant from a recipient, you're actually waiting for an HLA match. So this is the HLA match problem. So we're trying to address that directly by using genome engineering. And so what we came up with is this idea to actually engineer in these HLAs on demand in a single locus. So first, what we had to do is make a blank version of the iPSC, a version that does not have the class one HLAs. And so we used uh, <clears throat> a non-Cas9 CRISPR called NAD7. This is because it has lower costs for licensing. We developed this to delete the HLA-A region. Here you can see a PCR where it's got the correct editing and no longer any sequences for the HLA-A. We then deleted 100 kilobases of C and B, popped in the landing pad, and thus creating this blank human iPSC that can now accept new HLA alleles that we designed and made. So I mentioned that these genes span 1.4 megabases. We don't want to rewrite 1.4 megabases. So what we want to do is actually restructure the genome so that we can make this quicker and easier. So here, the idea is actually to move the HLA-A locus with all of its regulatory DNA in between C and B. And then we assembled this new synthetic version of the genomic region called SYNHLA, which has everything in one contiguous segment. And we can now pop it in in one shot. So we use yeast recombinating to assemble this new synthetic version that we can now restructure the human genome. And then we use rewrite and this struct to put in the 115,000 base pair SYNHLA construct. Here's the iPSCs with the landing pad, they're red. Uh, and then we popped in SYNHLA and now you can see that they're all green and all this red cells that don't have SYNHLA are dying off. And so this means we can now pop in uh, customized syn uh, HLA, class one HLAs matched to anybody. So you're probably wondering, well, how, if it's so, you know, polymorphic, what variants do we actually need to match most people? Um, a lot of these alleles are actually represented to some degree. And so we actually calculated that just six different haplotypes, meaning combinations of alleles A, B, and C, would cover over 50% of Northwest Europe, meaning like Britain, the Netherlands, Germany. And then just six would cover over 50% of Southern Chinese, like Hong Kong. And so we actually, have, are building these 12 right now in the lab. And that would mean we'd be able to cover over 50% of Europe and Southern China with just these six versions. The problem is once we start thinking about other more diverse ethnic populations. So here is an, uh, the matching percentage for other populations. Here you can see that these six would cover, uh, or 16 extended would cover Northwest Europe up to almost 70%. Hong Kong to a high level. But as you get to, for instance, Africa, you only get 20%. And that's because Africa is the most genetically diverse continent on the planet. But with gen genome engineering, we can actually imagine writing in these on demand, these different versions. Um, so now is an opportunity to actually address the disparities we have because you know often a lot of studies are focused on these low hanging fruit of the easily matched European population. The European populations are much more homogenous with their HLAs. And so we're often just finding the people we can in getting these HLAs. We can now engineer in these really rare HLAs for African populations, uh, Middle Eastern populations, which have very low matching, uh, American, South American populations, and even mixed race people to really get at these differences in how the immune system works, as well as have a cell that can be matched to anyone right away. And how we're building this is we're using yeast. We're keeping the SYNHLA construct. So that's one piece. We then CRISPR in the new alleles on demand. And these are all being built out really quickly. So now we have, we'll have a bank of every single haplotype ready to go. And so, We'll have these iPSCs for making somatocells, but the cell we really are interested in first is actually dendritic cells, these antigen presenting cells that interface between the innate and adaptive immune systems. This is what the new innovator award I have is for. Uh, dendritic cells are actually the main cell that utilize HLAs. They have two versions of HLAs, class ones, which we just talked about, but also class two HLAs. 
these HLAs actually interface with T cells. They activate T cells and tell the T cells which targets to actually go after. They also go after uh, helper T cells, regular t regulatory T cells by displaying peptides they find in the blood to also make antibodies. And so by manipulating the HLAs and iPSC, we can now make off the shelf versions of dendritic cells, which we can then um, interface, use these cells to then interface with many parts of the immune system. We can use these for programming in new antigens, thus program the immune system to find say new cancer targets, as well as um, different uh, foreign pathogens. And so the law of opportunities, if we can con control these dendritic cells, we can use it for activating the immune system against cancer itself with your endogenous uh, T cells. We can look for new T cell receptors that we can then engineer T cells towards specific targets. We can just define and uh, discover new cancer specific targets. We can also use it as a vaccine itself, a more targeted vaccine. We can also use it to induce tolerogenesis, meaning we can use it to tune or reduce the overreaction of the immune system, meaning reduce autoimmune reactions. So these are all possibilities with dendritic cells. Um, and a quick way to make dendritic cells is actually we're making the circuit. You like making the way you make iPSCs, you can just overexpress specific transcription factors that are found in the final cell type. And so these three transcription factors, when you overexpress them, can turn any cell into a dendritic cell right away. So we will have these two programmed HLAs, programmed dendritic cells, and then we can incubate them with blood from any patient to try and pull out these T cell receptors. And that's ongoing work that's happening right now. And finally, one technology I wanna mention that utilizes genome writing is this idea of surrogate reporters. It's this idea that we can basically identify differentiation as it goes along. So when you are in your final cell type, you're actually thinking about different transcription factors, right? Each cell type has a different transcription factor profile that identifies it as itself. And that information is actually in the promoter regions and regulatory DNA itself. So you can actually take the regulatory DNA of different transcription factors for a cell type of interest, fuse these all together in different arrays, put on different markers. And this basically displays as you differentiate your iPSCs to the cell type of interest. And so this large array can be programmed for different cell types, dendritic cells, monocytes, T cells, somatic cells, and give you kind of a colorful readout as well as an antibiotic resistance cassette for watching differentiation happen. You can use this with antibiotic resistance and it can it's a quicker way of scaling up processing to make big vats of somatic cells of interest. So that's another technology we are developing using genome writing. And this is only um, enabled because we can make DNA at the scale of 100,000 base pairs or more. So with that, uh, that's what I want to talk to you guys about. I want to thank my growing lab, the three core members, Sarah Levitz, Susanna Armilla, Minju Kim, postdoc, um, various other students in the lab that's growing, um, our department, including department chair, uh, NYU School of Medicine, which is sort of a separate entity uh, at NYU, Neochromosome members, and the Pandemic Response Lab, uh, funding, funding from NIAID, including New Innovators Award. And we are always hiring, so if you're interested in talking to me about writing the human genome in various new configurations, uh, please let me know. Thank you. Oh, thank you, thank you. So well, first thing I want to say is, if you are interested in doing fantastic research, join his lab. And that's my first thing I want to say. And, and the second thing I want to say is, uh, I would say this is one interesting coincidence. Uh, actually yesterday when at Imperial College London, where I gave a talk, I discussed uh, with many people, uh, this genome synthesis or engineering by mentioning Jeff Brooks uh, work. And then you, know, you are talking about a little bit about his work at the beginning of your introduction, I guess. So I'm not sure, you know, is it coincidence or fate uh, today? Uh, 
So actually, I have question uh, but before I kind of uh, looking at other question. Let me see uh, whether we have the question from the audience. Uh, just give me one second. Uh, yeah, okay. I'll, I'll start the question. So basically, you know, when we talk about yesterday, uh, those kind of genome engineering, you know, synthesis and so on, you know, one thing, you know, of course, common kind of question, you know, people may ask, and I also need to ask that to you. So could you kind of, you know, comment on ethics aspect of the technology? You know, I'm talking about gene, you know, gene synthesis, I mean, or gene, or genome, entire genome synthesis, given it is being developed very quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so ethics is a very big, tricky area, right? So mm -hmm. when we start talking about the human genome, mm -hmm. people start to get a little iffy. Mm -hmm. um, I think the big fears with... Well, first of all, we have to make sure we know why we're doing it. Right? Mm -hmm. So when we start addressing playing God is what people will accuse us of, mm -hmm. uh, writing the human genome at scale is why are we doing it? Are we doing it because just because we can, uh, just to show off, or mm -hmm. are we doing it for a purpose? And mm -hmm. I think as, lo as long as we are defining it for a purpose because it's beneficial and helpful for humanity, mm -hmm. that we are thinking about how to help people um, having a real problem to solve, I think society will accept that. You know, when mm -hmm. we think about cancer, uh, making, you know, new medicines for, you know, diseases of old age, people will have an easy time accepting that. We already kind of do that in some ways. That's what gene therapy is, right? That's what edited cells are for CAR T. Mm -hmm. That's a smaller scale version of genome writing, mm -hmm. 13 foreign genes. Mm -hmm. Um, when we start to say we can modify large sections of the genome, though, mm -hmm. I think people start to get iffy because they think it's unnatural. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. genome is, a, is supposed to be a specific way. Why would you change the genome? And that's because we have a little bit of ignorance of what exactly is in the genome. There's a mm -hmm. big fear that what if you do something that's catastrophic? What mm -hmm. if you do something that causes the cells to become, say, cancer? Mm -hmm. uh, we actually know what causes cancer for the most part. You know, there are often genes involved in growth or cell cycle regulation, mm -hmm. they're overexpression. And so we, we know what not to modify, but mm -hmm. there's actually a greater opportunity to make the cell safer. Mm -hmm. Our cells already have this inherent, you know, uh, non unsafe profile mm -hmm. they, where they can easily get changed to become cancer. Mm -hmm. And the final thing is that I think we need to avoid working with cells that can be inherited in it, into the population, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? Cells that have a finite amount of time, meaning mm -hmm. they can only be used therapeutically within you mm -hmm. for your lifetime at most, and they can't contribute to the germline. Mm -hmm. And we got to reassure people about these very specific things. So that's yeah. a really good question, yeah. And I think yeah that, that's a fantastic answer uh, about uh, on very, you know, challenging or controversial kind of, you know, issue. And actually, the when I was very young, I mean, the college student, uh, you know, I, we, I saw the, the dolly, uh, the ship kind of clone, and I saw that, you know, one of the Time magazine. And, and then at that time, I was thinking about, and they kind of talking about uh, Dream Team, <laughs> consisting of six Michael Jordan uh, basketball team. And then they're talking about those things. And then I kind of, oh my God, what's going on? And then, and then when I start my position, uh, what's you? Uh, when I start my you know, synthetic biology course, and then my, you know, one of the, my ethics related kind of lecture is start with one question, something like, uh, let's say, you know, your you know, daughter or your wife, unfortunately, uh, had you know, leukemia. And then, however, my question is to the student, you know, you, you know, we have solution because scientists or doctor could clone your wife or daughter for the transplantation. And what would be your answer? And that's actually always my question to my student. What would be your answer? Uh, I would not do it personally. Okay. <laughs> And then, no. and then, of course, I mean, many people will say that. In that case, if I say provide human cloning without 
head only the bottom but except this head part what would be your answer i, I would still say no personally okay um i, I think i i i me personally i don't know i mean it's it's one of those things where using a human body to that full extent where you're developing uh -huh. it that much uh -huh. uh, passes an ethical boundary for me personally sure. I don't know in what that case, I'm, In that case, I mean, if I provide, I only cloning the stem cell part mm -hmm. from your wife or your daughter, what would be your answer? If it's only the organ itself for me, mm -hmm. that's fine, right? Mm -hmm. But if, if you're going up through development, mm -hmm. the entire process and developing mm -hmm. limbs and skin and the entire mm -hmm. tissue, that mm -hmm. gets a lot more iffy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that, that's interesting. So, you know, I ask that question every single year for 10 years. <laughs> and then the, the, the percentage of yes a little bit increase every year. Really? So that is kind of people's, you know, new generation thinking a little bit differently. Yeah. And that's compared cool. to the old, older guys. And then I was shocked. I mean, even Dolly, clone. So now you new generation will be thinking more radically uh, from my perspective. But you know, still, I mean, that's an interesting discussion. We always ask, uh, always should do, I mean, as an educator. So that's why I'm kind of brought up that one because we had an interesting conversation yesterday until 8.30 p.m. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, that's a really interesting question. I think I might yeah. take that question. I mean, we, yeah. we certainly are capable of doing stuff like that. Mm -hmm. the <laughs> yeah just uh no one wants to um, yeah so we need to we, we need to prevent any catastrophic kind of problem or the digester so that's why i kind of come up you know basically in asking that question because your work is a little bit related not necessarily directly but a little bit related to those kind of problems right right okay um you yeah, if, any, if, I, if I say one last thing about that is that uh, mm -hmm. the technology we have for writing this genome is actually far, far behind actually changing to another person or anything. Sure. And the genome's so big, and we don't really know what's going on in the genome. So we actually, yeah, you, 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 even you know, you know, you know, synthesizing entire uh, genome. I mean, of course, the you know, Venter actually a long time ago, you know, so called create. Yeah, you create in a new cell, but that is not necessarily creation, right? That's right. basically copying the exactly same sequence and then basically reboot the cell mm -hmm. by putting the synthetic DNA. So, but they use the creation in a very interesting way, then then right. then become sensational. So, right. I mean, but still, we are not there yet. So, but we still st thinking about the consequence of you know those technology at the end of the day. So that's how I'm kind of bringing up that you know, uh, thing. Okay, let me check. Uh, okay, so I didn't see a question from Q&A. And then where is the chat? Uh, my chat here. Okay. Okay, I see. All right, so I will close. So thank you so much for your wonderful talk. Uh, I'm, I'm fascinating. Again, if you are interested in doing fantastic uh, research, consider him. He is the fabulous you know, researcher and then his project is fantastic. I believe that. And so thank you all uh, for joining and staying today, uh, especially the week of holidays or vacation. We'll meet again next week on July 14, Thursday, the same time, the same Zoom link. But I will be joining from, oh, Spain. Uh, actually, that's not, I need to change that one. I changed the schedule. So let me look at my schedule. Uh, I actually changed the schedule because of my conflict. So let me correct. Uh, next week. Okay, so next week, oh, I'm sorry. So we will still meet the same day. Okay, I got confused. Okay, we'll meet Thursday, July 14. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm got confused. So we'll meet the, uh, again next week on July 14, Thursday, 
the same time, the same Zoom link, but we'll, I'll be joining from Spain after my 22nd invited talk at Technion Israel. And then following week, uh, we will not meet regular Thursday, but we'll meet July 18, Monday, and I will I'll be still in Spain at the time, but rather than Thursday because of my conflict uh, with some other things. So, but next week we'll meet the July 14, but following week we'll meet the Monday, July 18, the same time. Next week we'll have Professor Michael Ledis at Purdue University, an um, NAE member, and then Dr. Alexander Mitkars at University of Delaware. And, and then uh, as usual, the follow-up informal chat will occur without recording. So please stay here if you are interested in chatting with us. Uh, thank you so much. And then I will stop recording. Okay, let me stop recording.